This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Harry's, the shaving gear you will respect, not throw away. To get $5 off your first order, go to harrys.com and use the offer code MACVOICES. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac Community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, I have the privilege of speaking with Mr. David Sparks, the author of the brand new Mac Sparky Field Guide presentations. David, it's great to see you or actually hear from you. Thanks for being here. Chuck, you know, one of these days I'm going to do a video with you. But as I was telling you offline, my uh, my house is kind of small. So the, the, the Mac Sparky headquarters is in the bedroom. And I think if I put a camera on, I might not be married by the end of the show. So you just get in my face this time. Hey, that's that's perfectly all right. I I get it. I get it. Um, and it you know, hey, everybody everybody has those those challenges and restrictions because I get plenty of email about the condition of my office. <laughs> I bet you do. It, you know, oh, thanks, David. <laughs> <laughs> it just I said it. I said it a couple of shows ago. It seems like when I start a new personal project project, it explodes all over my office. So, all um, right, I could take that. Yeah, and I and I'm sure it happens to you too. So, so David, presentations, yet another Max Sparky field guide. You're just cranking them out. You know, you say that, but it doesn't feel like it. it. There's just this one I started writing two years ago. So it feels to me like this one's been a long time in the making. But, um, but no, I, I agree. It, it's really great. And uh, the, this is maybe my favorite so far. They're like children. I can't pick a favorite. But uh, this book really came out fantastic. The design is brand new. And... And the content, I think, is pretty good, too. There's so many things here, David, I want to cover. First of all, though, the the, the success of the book. Uh, I mean, you are you are up there. In fact, I think I saw a, a tweet um, by Katie Floyd of your partner in Mac Power Users that at one point you were beating um, uh, Dowling. Uh, or what, what's her name with um, the Harry Potter books? J.K. Rowling. J.K. Yeah. Rowling. Thank you. Yeah, with you were you were above uh, her Harry Potter books. And it's like wow, that's kind of impressive. Yeah, well, that you know, for a very brief moment in time, <laughs> I had a, I put the book on for pre-sale, so we had quite a few um, um, readers that had purchased it in pre-sale. So the first day that you get this flood of purchases, so it looks like you're even better than you know Fifty Shades of Grey and all these other books that are selling many, many copies every day. I, I'm certainly not there anymore, but it, it really feels good even just for a little brief period of time seeing yourself up at the top of those charts. Well, and and you figure any, t- any time you get that high in the charts, I don't care what your excuse is, you're doing good because that means yeah. even, a, even a quick hit means that there are a lot of books sold and a lot of interested in this, interest in yeah. this. To me, that translates into two things. First of all, your credibility in explaining these things. And second, the the success of the, a book on presentations that just kind of says it all. Yeah, it's funny because my books are kind of an anomaly, and this is true with a lot of the subjects I've covered in the Max Parkey Field Guide series because it's not simply just a manual of how to use Keynote. Just like the email book isn't just how to use the mail program. Uh, part of it is a manual. Part of it is teaching you how to get much better at the the existing tools. But another big part of it is, I guess what I call the religion part of it, where I talk about, you know, what makes a good presentation or what, why is email so hard? And by kind of treading both of those lines, it makes the book kind of an outlier. I mean, there aren't many, I'm sure there's plenty of books that tell you how to make a good presentation. And there's plenty of books that tell you how to use Keynote. There aren't too many that try to combine that. And it's it's interesting for the readers because I get uh, feedback from a lot of readers, and some talk about how you know it really helped them, and how they feel like they're really great at using Keynote, and others that say, yeah, that, all the stuff about Keynote was really good, but that part where you told me what to do to avoid completely freaking out when I stand up—that's the part that was worth the ten bucks to me. And it's just fun to see how different people react differently to those portions of the book. And David, that's that I think is what separates this from a lot of other books because you do cover some nuts and bolts of the presentation programs, uh, mainly Keynote, of course, but you also cover all that other design stuff, the preparation stuff, the stuff that turns you into a really great presenter that too often just gets skipped over because somebody says, oh, I've, I've got to get up and talk. And so I think I'll put all my bullet points and maybe a couple cute graphics up on the wall behind me. Yeah, and 
and frankly, most of that was just born out of experience. I, I didn't spend a lot of time surveying the existing materials out there. I, I just, you know, my whole career I've been giving presentations and, and I've just kind of put together these common tricks. Like one of the tricks I talk about in the book that a lot of people seem to really like is memorize your first 30 seconds. It's just whatever you're going to give a speech, memorize the first 30 seconds. You don't have to memorize the whole thing. But, you know, I made the analogy in the book to a rocket ship. You know, when the rocket ship is on the launch pad, when's the most likely time that rocket ship is going to blow up? It's on the launch pad. Probably, you know, the, yes. the, usually it's – if it gets okay. off the launch pad, usually it's going to be okay. But uh, your, your speech is the same way. If you get started okay, usually you do just fine. If you get started poorly, uh, you could just end up a big crater right up there at the lectern. So <laughs> – so memorize the first 30 seconds. Just things like that, I think, are very common sense, but also quite useful. Let's talk about, you just mentioned your career. Your career is an attorney. Yeah. So by the very nature of that, you are constantly presenting. You're presenting in court. You're presenting to clients. You're presenting to opposing uh, parties. So it's it's a constant state of presentation, uh, formal or informal. And so I, I found a lot of these tips to be good, whether I'm standing up in front of, you know, 100 people or three people. Yeah, I think that'd be true. And, you know, an attorney in a lot of ways is a sales guy. I mean, you're selling an idea and you need to think of ways to connect with your audience. And I think that's something that a lot of people who have to give a presentation never give any thought to. And in my opinion, it's the first thing you should think about. Agreed. Agreed. So – Talk a little bit about the design of the book because this time you you stepped outside. You got a little extra talent to help uh, change the design of this book and maybe look look a little better. And I the the first thing I want to ask you is talk about that, but also why did you decide to go that direction? I I've always felt that the content, and I think I used this analogy on your show last time when I did the email book, is I always like the idea of Pixar movies because, because they're so good. They tell a really good story and it's really good technology and they pull it all together. And, you know, in my head, you know, in my little Walter Mitty like existence, I feel like my tech books are going to be like the Pixar movies of books. And when I finished the email book, I felt like I delivered good content and I delivered great learning materials. And I did a new design for the email book, kind of that craftsman look that was really near and dear to my heart and still is frankly. But then I got thinking, you know, the one part of this where I di I'm not delivering the best experience is the design because uh, I'm not a graphic designer and I have an appreciation of white space and I watch the videos and I read the books, but that doesn't, it's still not my profession. And there's a lot of places that I could have done that better. And I started looking around and I found Stefan Graham at Make Do Good. It's called Make Period Do Good. You should look them up. They're really great and super nice people. And I approached them. They're up in San Francisco. So I was up there at Macro when we first started talking. And they helped me, you know, with the design of the book. And it it just came out great. I'm really happy with it. it. It not that the other books weren't, but this has a very polished, refined look to it. Yeah. I mean, I've always, you know, the the idea is that they're field guides and you know, another effect of my age is I grew up watching Indiana Jones movies. And uh, I don't know if you remember the uh, the Grail diary he carried around in the third movie. You know, the, uh, it was just a little, little book that had all the little bits of information he needed. And whenever he had to get it, he pulled it out. And in my head, you know, as a little kid, that, that sunk in, that that's what a field guide is. And I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Now I have a field guide called an iPhone that I keep in my pocket, right? But I wanted my books to be like field guides. And I, I like the the dichotomy of a book about technology that feels like an Indiana Jones field guide. So I, one of the, the things I said to Stephen Graham is I, I want to go further with that. I want it to feel even more like a field guide. And I think they really helped me get there. Just even the types of graphics we use, the typography. Yeah, I don't know. You just have to kind of experience. <laughs> Speaking of experience, another thing that distinguishes the, the Max Sparky field guides is the inclusion of video. You're a video monster. You, <laughs> you use iBooks Author to create these books, and you really – I'm not going to say rely heavily, but you, you supplement your ideas and and the, the, the material with videos of how to do it, what to do it, why to do it. 
and, and I and I love that, but that's an, a huge investment in time and effort. Yes, it's not easy. This book has forty four screencasts in it, and they cover everything from how to plan a presentation to how to create custom graphics in Keynote. You know, just any part of it that I thought the words weren't good enough to share it with. And for learning technology, there really is nothing better than a well produced video or screencast where someone can look over your shoulder and watch you do it. And I learned that, frankly, back when I was writing, you know, the old old timey books that were printed on paper. And I would try to explain something, you know, in relation to technology. And it was just so difficult to do it when you had a couple screenshots and a couple words, whereas you could just watch me do it and you could stop the video and you could watch every step and you could pick it up in just a couple minutes. And, you know, so for the type of of teaching I'm trying to do, there is nothing better than being able to put those videos in. But but you're right, it's it's an it's a tremendous amount of work. It, it's funny sometimes the amount of time investment to minutes is scary. I, I, one of the videos in this book, it was the I did one of the screencasts where I one of the tricks I use with Kino is a lot of times if I want a graphic image of something in the real world and I want it to be roughly the right scale and everything, I just take a picture of it and I put it on the screen in Kino. So I'll just take a picture, and, and the example I use in a book is a magnifying glass, but it could be anything. And then I use the graphics tools in Kino to draw a picture of the magnifying glass right on top of it. And you get the circle the exact right size, you get the barrel the right size, you know, you get everything just right because you've got kind of a template you're laying it on top of. And then when you're done, you delete the underlying picture and you've got this really nice looking graphic and then you can group it with the tools in Keynote and suddenly you've got this really great looking graphic and people are like, wow, who'd you go to to make that for you? And, it, you know, the cheat was you just basically drew, you just traced it just like when you were a little kid. When I made that screencast, I'll never forget, it was like a Saturday morning about a month before the book went out and everything went wrong with that screencast. And it took me for something like four minutes of video. I probably had four hours. I think I had like an hour per minute to get that screencast right. You know, and, and it was just silly things like, you know, at, at, at one point, you know, the buffer got full. And suddenly, even though I, I nailed it, the, the, the computer wasn't capturing the video at the right frame. Right. So even when I got it right, I got it wrong, you know, <laughs> and I realized that day, the reason why there aren't a lot of competitors, to the Max Barkey field guides, is because nobody else in the world is crazy enough to try and make these things. <laughs> well, I, you know, I've tried, I've tried playing with screencasts and the funny thing is this kind of video for, for me is so much easier because you turn it on, it captures whatever's going on when the other, the other, party has video, you, they capture what they're going on, then you edit together, you know, and, and it looks okay. But there's something about screencasts that are just not easy. So I, I, I want people to appreciate the amount of work and time and trouble. You didn't just sit down and decide, oh, I'm going to capture, uh, you know, five minutes of my screen. No, it doesn't work that way, folks. No, no, not at all. But I still bow to the altar of our friend in Liverpool. I mean, he's the pro. Mr. McAllister, yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I'm I'm constantly, and and once in a while he'll let out a couple of little secrets about how he's producing it, what tools, and exactly how he's approaching it. And it's like, wow, you know, the amount of time he's put in to learn all those lessons is staggering. Yeah, and he has he did a show with us on Mac Power Users within the last year where he talked about what he's doing, and he's really got a whole team now. So it's it's uh, impressive what he's done over there. Yeah, as, as I recall, I was listening to that in the car, and I had to stop to take notes. Yeah. So it's fun, though. I tell you, I love that type of learning. And I love the emails I get from people who read the books and tell me how, you know, they never understood something and then they watched it and the light bulb went off. And I get my own little endorphins when I hear hear about that from readers. <laughs> so, David, why why a presentations book? I mean, I, I know the presentations are a big part of your life as as an attorney. But why did you think that the time was right? Why did you think that there were no presentation books out there that really covered it the way you wanted it to to be? Well, there, there's just very few presentation books out there that incorporate the video and the rich media that I do. So I knew there was not going to be any books like mine. The reason why I do a presentation book, like I said, this one has been a couple of years in the making. 
is that um, I just feel like this mandate to try and make presentations better because I watch so many terrible ones. <laughs> I, I, I'll compete with you on that one. I, you know, I, I, I really feel with every title in the Max Barkey Field Guide series, including the next one, which I've already started on, um, each book is not made because I think it's a good market or, you know, I've done some, like, who's going to write a book on Markdown, right? Most people don't even know what it is. <laughs> But yeah. that there's areas of technology that I think people can get better at and that can make their lives better. And I think that they just need a little help figuring it out. And that's my criteria for the next book. I, To my own you know, fault, probably, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what's going to be the big seller. It's more of is what do I have to get out of my system next? And presentations was pretty high on the list. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Harry's. The shaving gear you will respect, not throw away. Let's talk about razor handles. I know, I know. Seems like a trivial thing, right? Think about it, though. This is the piece of equipment that you use pretty much every day of your life. This is the piece of equipment that is the only thing standing between your face and a razor blade. Or two. Or three. Or four. Or five. Get the wrong one, and you get a poor shave at best. And a bloodletting at worst. That won't happen with Harry's handles. From the Truman, with its zinc alloy core and polymer coating, to the Winston's precision-grade aluminum and comfortable heft, Harry's handles feel good in your hand. Substantial. Solid. Like a MacBook Air. Not too heavy. Not too fragile. Just right. Want to give yourself a treat? Check out the Truman SS14 for more stylish colors and a wood end cap, or get your initials engraved on your Winston. Why? just because. Then pair those with Harry's blades, which fit all of Harry's handles. Each cartridge holds five, count them, five separate German engineer blades in a gothic arch pattern. What's a gothic arch pattern and why do you care? You can read about it on Harry's website if you're interested, but the important thing to know is that it's important for a good shave. Each cartridge also has a rubber hinge to flex to the contours of your face. Because flexible is good, since you don't want those five sharp blades to cut anything other than whiskers. All that adds up to a superior razor and a superior shave. One of life's little treats each morning. And we all need little treats of one kind or another. Why not get yours now and get $5 off your first Harry's order with the offer code MACVOICES. Whether you go for just a handle and blade to get started, a shave set to sample handle, blades, and Harry's shaving cream, or dive right in and sign up for a custom shave plan, you can save $5 with the code MACVOICES at harrys.com. You're going to love it. Harry's, the shaving gear you will respect, not throw away. Thanks to Harry's for their support of Mac Voices. So walk us through in a general fashion the presentations book and what you cover and, and how you covered. We sort of dove in the middle because I'm this is a subject I'm very passionate about too. But maybe give us just a very, very high level outline of what people will find in the book. Sure. The, the book has five chapters in it. And uh, the first just deals with the current state of presentations and why we have words like death by PowerPoint or phrases like death by PowerPoint and and gives you basically a little bit of background about me. I, I was a very early adopter with presentation software because when I first started practicing law, it was all about blow ups and you had to have these big, massive blow ups and you'd go in the court courthouse. Anybody who went in a courthouse 20 years ago probably witnessed this. Uh, Guys getting on elevators or or, or ladies getting on elevators and they've got these um, big, big blow-ups covered in like plastic bags or something and they're carrying them around, banging into each other and then they get in a courtroom and all that stuff was very expensive and it was also very time consuming to create. So when you went to trial, you had to be very judicious about what you were going to get blown up and what you didn't. And then once you wrote on a blow up or something, that was that. You weren't going to be able to, to unwrite on it. And it was just a massive pain. And as soon as presentation software showed up, I realized that I could have a lot of blow ups and I could have a lot more control over what they say and I could make modifications to them over lunch and then and show them, you know, in the following hour, and just it just gave me so many more options that I immediately jumped in. And and the other thing I talk about is that I I've, I've always been a very much a visual thinker, which is why I never really got into the idea of lots of bullet points and words on the screen. And it's just my own 
uh, you know, my own failing really that actually fortuitously led me to make pretty good presentations. So without even knowing it, I was doing pretty good at the beginning. And then I start talking about, okay, so let's talk about how you make a good presentation. We get into chapter two and um, my, one of the big themes of the whole book is, you know, a presentation should tell a story and that's really easy to say up on the mountaintop, but um, it's true. And it needs to tell a story that connects with your audience if you want them to give a damn. So uh, you need to figure that out. And it's not something where you sing, sit around and sing kumbaya. It, there's some definite techniques that you can use to develop a story around what you want to do. And I go through how I do that and how I think you should go about doing it. And I have examples and videos and things to kind of show you. And then kind of from there we go, say, once you have your story, then it makes it a lot easier to plan it. One of the big points I make in that section of the book is you shouldn't have Keynote or PowerPoint or whatever your presentation software open is at that time. You shouldn't have been thinking about what your transitions and these things are. You should just be thinking about what the stories you're going to tell and how you're going to tell it. And then once you get that done, then you get into the presentation software. You with me so far? I'm with you so far. Then uh, once you've got that done, then you can open your presentation software and make no bones about it. This is a book about Keynote. If you want to get really good at PowerPoint, I think you'll be able to use, use a lot of portions of this book to get good at PowerPoint, but you're not going to get a bunch of lessons on how to use PowerPoint because you know, I had to pick a horse. And uh, even as much as I like these videos, um, 44 screencasts is really pushing the limit. You know, I'm like Mr. <laughs> Scotty, you know, he's giving her all she can, Captain, you know. And so I'm not going to make a book that does a half – Oops, I almost said a bad word. I'm not going to make a book that does a partial job of covering two programs. I'm going to make a book that does a really good job of covering one. And in my mind, if you're driving a Mac, there's Keynote is the answer. It's just, it's just, there's, it has a lot of advantages. Some of them aren't even fair, but they are advantages. And so I cover Keynote in great, great detail. So by the time you get to the end of that, you'll be able to run it on Keynote on your iPad and on your phone and on your Mac and do all kinds of great things with it. And then the there is a small chapter that covers some of the options to Keynote because there are some quite interesting like web-based solutions and iOS stuff out there. And then the final chapter is called Presentation Day. And it goes actually back a little bit about that. But it talks about, you know, once you've created your presentation, what are the steps you need to make to turn that presentation into a successful presentation day? And it's got a lot of common sense advice. Maybe some you've heard before, maybe some you haven't. But it's kind of a brain dump from me about how I pull these things off. And I love the common sense part. There's so many things that I, so many presentations I see go wrong. And they are just common sense things that if you if the person would step back, look at the presentation he or she is about to give, they would say, that's stupid. But they never do. It's it's like they get so locked into their thinking and the way that they think it should be presented as opposed to the, the way that you would naturally present it if you didn't have some of the tools. And, and that to me is always something that just I, I'm shocked by how many times I see that. And and I, I repeat, I'm sure I could compete with you on how many bad presentations you've had to sit through. You know, I think in some ways, presentation software can be a curse if you don't approach it intelligently. Because, it, you know, one of the points I make in the book is there there really is nothing. Well, I'm sure there are. <laughs> there, there, standing up in front of a crowd can be terrifying. I think we could all agree to that. I've been doing it my whole life. I still get the jitters sometimes. And I get that. And I, I think that's one, one of the points I try to make in the book. It's okay to have those feelings. But what's not okay is to say, okay, I'm going to wrap myself in this warm safety blanket, which is I'm going to write down my entire presentation in words and put it on the screen. And just in case I get up there and I get nervous, then I can turn around and read the words. Well, as soon as you stand up in front of a group, you are going to be nervous. So what are you going to do? You're going to turn around and read the words instead of uh, read the words on the screen, and you've just you know joined the death by PowerPoint club. So, so I, I try to give you tips. One, number one is I tell you you know you can't do that. It's not your script. And number two, here's how you can make a presentation that will help you and give you that warm safety blanket without making you a terrible presenter. So, I think I'm rambling a little bit. 
no, you're not rambling. I, a, a point I want to go back to, though, because you sort of glossed over it. I've seen a number of your presentations. You you don't keep a lot of words on screen. No, no, I don't. And and, and that that's kind of an easy out to say, oh, you want to make a better presentation? Don't put any words on the screen. Bada bing, bada boom. It doesn't really work that way, right? But But the fact is, if you put a lot of words on the screen, it does – it does kind of cause people to be distracted from you. Uh, I, d- I also do audio interviews in these books. One of them is with Les Posen, who's a really well-regarded presenter. And and also, I believe, I'm going to get this wrong, I believe he's a clinical psychologist, if memory serves. But um, one of the points he made is, you know, just the way our brains are wired. If you put words on the screen, people will read them. And a further corollary to that is because the way our brains are wired, if they are reading the words, they are not listening to you. And, you know, you just got to accept that. So you, what are you up there to do? Are you up there to introduce words to the crowd? Are you in a, up there to, you know, give a presentation? And I would argue that the the kind of presentation where you're giving the presentation and the words are just, you know, locking in what you're saying and reaffirming in their minds the points you're making that's going to be a much more interesting presentation, and that's one where your audience is much less likely, much more likely to remember what you said. And David, why is that such a hard concept to understand? I, because people are afraid. Just like I, said, I mean, I think it's terrifying to stand up there, and especially if you don't do it often. And they say, "Well, you need to give a talk." Well, what are you going to do? Well, if you write the words down, you know you'll never forget the words. Yeah, but. Uh, it, I think that's such a simple concept that if you put words up there, they're going to read it. So put less words up there. You know, put, I mean, if you want to bullet point something, okay, I get it. You know, depending on what the topic is, that can actually, I think, be beneficial because it, if, if you put a set of four bullet points up, I think it can help keep those points in front of the, the audience and, and maybe they'll relate to them. Let them, let them read them. And then, you know, the worst they can do is go back and reread them. Well, here's a trick for that because sometimes I use bullet points too. It's not like I I declare words illegal. Sometimes I need words too. But if you're going to put bullet points up like that, and this is one of the tricks I show in the book, is you set you set up an animation series. So, and you can use a simple animation like wipe in Kino, where it just wipes the letters on the screen. You don't put all four bullet points on the screen when as soon as you as soon as you click the slide. What you do is it's a blank slide, and then you click once, and the first bullet point wipes on the screen, and you pause for a minute and let them read the words, and then you explain why those words are important, and you don't let them see anymore. You know, it's just like you don't show them the dessert menu while they're trying to pick the appetizer. You just show them the appetizer, and then you get to the next one, and you click again, and you show it off. And it's a simple trick, but it really helps keep the audience focused on you when you have to get bullet points. And as much as I hate a lot of words on screen, it it lets you put more words on screen and yet minimize that that effect of reading and being distracted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, so, I'm such a nerd about this stuff, Chuck. Well, it's you know, listen, that's that's great because it 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 just goes to show you how deeply you've dug into it, how much time you spent thinking about it. And again, it's not just you're not just an academic who is sitting there thinking, okay, I think this would make a great presentation. I mean, you've got a lot of battle scars. Well, yeah, that's the thing is most everything I tell you not to do in the book is something that I've done repeatedly and got my teeth kicked in on. So it's not like, you know, that's a great visual. Thank you, David. Yeah, that's Uh, true. So, so talk just for a second again about the presentation day. Can you give us one hint from presentation day? That, uh, so uh, many. Yeah. So I'm, many. <laughs> well, some, you know, one, of my, one of my favorite things in it is, did you see the page with my presentation toolbox? I'm not recalling. Oh, you got to see that. There's, there's a page in there where, because I have a toolbox I, I carry around. I usually just keep it in my trunk. But, you know, one of the biggest things that happen on presentation day is a failure of technology. I mean, you can, you can spend hours and hours building your story and crafting your slides and practicing. And if you show up and they don't have the right cable, it's all for naught. So I, uh, I have what I call the Max Barkey presentation toolbox. And I have a, a 
Home Depot purchase toolbox that I keep things in. And I uh, there's a slide in it that came out really great. Or I, I'm sorry, there's a page in it that came out really great where I, I took the toolbox and I just laid everything on the floor in my house and took a picture of it. And then I put little pop-ups because iBooks author lets you put a little pop-ups. So you can tap on each one and I can explain why you need to carry that. And, and you can see everything that goes in my toolbox. But, you know, that's one of the things you can do for presentation day that will that will save your bacon at least once is just have a toolbox and throw it in the trunk. You don't even have to bring it into the venue with you. So long as it's in your trunk out in the parking lot, if something goes wrong and you get there early enough, you're going to be just fine. That's brilliant because so often you don't have – the the opportunity to use all of your own equipment. If you if you're taking the the projector or you know whatever the, the you have the luxury of taking your own LCD screen or LED screen, that's fantastic. But more often than not, you're going to walk into a place, you're going to be using their projection equipment, and like you say, if it's not set up right, you, you're you're done before you start. Yeah, yeah. So this is in the iTunes bookstore. Um, how, yeah, how, how much is it? Nine ninety nine, ten bucks, just like all the others. Ten and, bucks. Uh, you can get it in the iTunes bookstore. I, I've got a really cool URL for it. It's iTunes dot com slash presentations. Oh, Ooh. that's pretty slick, huh? Yeah. You want to tell us how you accomplish that, or is that a secret? I have no idea how I accomplished that. <laughs> Somebody at Apple said, "Would you like that URL?" And I said, "Why? Yes, thank you. I would." Holy cow, that's impressive. <laughs> You don't That's ask – when Apple does something nice for you, you don't ask why or how. You just say thank you. Yeah, and send flowers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and also you can find it at maxsparky.com slash presentations oh, and, and the links there. And I also have a PDF version too. That was the next question. What, what are the other options should there be someone who doesn't own an iPad? Yeah. Well, if you don't own an iPad and you own a Mac – you can still get it because they have iBooks out there now on the Mac. But, you know, it's only in 51 countries. There's a lot more countries than that. But that's the only ones that I can sell it in right now through iBooks author. And uh, so some people, um, you know, notably Singapore and, and China and I believe Russia, don't have it yet. And I get a lot of emails from people in those countries asking, you know, when are you going to do this? And I tell them as soon as I can, <laughs> as soon as Apple lets me. Um, but in the meantime, I sell a PDF version. And you don't just get the PDF. You get all of the screencasts. There's a folder in there that has all the screencasts. So you can just drop it right into your iTunes or watch it on your Mac or whatever. And all the there's picture galleries as well. And I put all the picture galleries in there. So I've got all that stuff available to you. And um, if you buy the PDF, you're going to get the same content, although it's not as nice because with the iBooks author books, everything is integrated into one file and you can flip through the book. You can watch it on an airplane. It's, it's very nice. Yeah. The, I, and your tra your use of iBooks author, I'm, I would venture to say that you're on the, on the cutting edge of iBooks authoring. Uh, I think, I, I think I am for small publishers. I mean, I think there's some big, big, companies that are putting teams of people on it and they're coming up with some pretty great stuff too but i think in terms of small guys i i would say mine is about as good as it gets david out of curiosity how with with all those screencasts in there how large is the book itself um it's it well the first pass it was like two and a half gigabytes but um, I was able to do some work on the video files and, you know, with some massaging of the um, the data and checking the image files. It didn't affect the actual quality of the book, but I was able to kind of scale down some pieces to get it to, I think, the end of it ended up being about 1.2 gigabytes. And once again, that's about as far as you want to go with an iBooks author book. Yeah. I mean, that that requires a commitment to download, but... You know, that, yeah, not, not that bad. I mean, again, you know, I, my answer to that always is start it when you go to bed and it'll be ready for you in the morning. Or if you've got a decent, you know, if you're on a Wi-Fi connection, don't please don't do it on your LTE. I don't want to be responsible for you spending all your data. But but if you do it on a Wi-Fi connection, I mean, it ta I think it takes on mine at my house, it takes about 15 minutes. It's not so bad. No, it's not bad at all. Yeah. So it's maxsparky.com to get a look at everything, find it. You can find it in the iTunes bookstore, PDF or iBooks author version. Um, go get it and, and be a better presenter because there's, there's no one who can take you through this process quite the same way that David can. I hope so. And, and, you know, I try to make the books fun still, and there's, there's a little funny bits in there, but I don't try and overdo it. But 
I, you know, I hope you have a good time while you get better at this stuff too. Boy, you said a mouthful. Because it's you know it's fun. It's it's fun when you get up there and are able to do a, what you think is a great presentation, have it received really well, and have people come up and say, "Yeah, I really enjoyed it," or "That was a great presentation." A few things more fun than that. Yeah, and it feels really great. It does. So let's let's talk for a second about where else folks can find you. Um, there's this little thing called Mac Power Users. Yeah, yeah, my podcast that I do with my pal Katie Floyd is Mac Power Users, and in it we do um, shows are usually about an hour and a half, and we do uh, kind of deep dives on specific subjects uh, relevant to Apple Mac iOS users. So you know we'll do a show on something like email where we'll just talk about email for an hour and a half and what our favorite tools are. And we've been doing it for, you know, I've lost, I think it's five years now we're on, we just recorded show two Oh six, I believe. And, and we also do these workflow shows where we have someone in like Don McAllister and say, how do you get all this great stuff done? And you get to hear their favorite tools and tricks. And it's just a blast. I love doing it every day. You can find it over at MacPowerUsers.com. And you can also find it at 5 by 5tv slash MPU. And then, of course, there's a link to it at MacSparky.com. And, and I'm sorry. And then, you know, MacSparky.com is kind of the place you can find everything that I do. Yeah. And, of course, you're on Twitter. Yeah, you know, I love Twitter. Uh, it's at MacSparky. Okay. I'm and doing, it, Chuck, I just, I just signed up for uh, Facebook after all these years. I was just about to say any other of the social networks, not expecting uh, you to say Facebook. No, I just, I've always had a thing against Facebook. It's, I don't really like their privacy thoughts and all that, but my wife and my whole family's on it. And I've been on it now for like three days and I'm already having angst about it. I don't even know what to do. I'm getting friend invites from people that I didn't know and who were barely my friends or barely knew existed in high school. And now do I have to, do I have to say yes to them? And Ah, oh, this is why I never got into Facebook, Chuck. By the time this goes on air, I may I may no longer be on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so so this could be a new Max Sparky Field Guide. Is no, know, it will never be a Max Sparky Field be. Guide. <laughs> <laughs> oh darn! I, I was hoping you would take all the slings and arrows from me. To, no. To, uh, <laughs> Hey, David, it's great to talk to you. Thanks so much, and, and congratulations on the book, and thank you for the book. I, I've, I'm looking forward to absorbing it completely and adopting every single idea. Okay. Well, Chuck, I, I think this is a mutual admiration society. I love what you bring to our community, and I love seeing you in my feed and seeing what interesting information you are bringing to all of us, and I want to thank you. It's, it's, it's always my pleasure because I get to talk to great people like you, like Katie, like Don. Uh, there's there's so many f amazing people in this community that it's it's just good to be able to talk to them and share those conversations. Amen, brother. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Chuck. We will. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. I can't encourage you enough to go and check out presentations by David Sparks. It will make you a better presenter. And if you think you're not presenting, then you're missing the boat because you're presenting every day. You just may not realize it. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at MacVoices.com slash newsletter. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at BackbeatMedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at Cashfly.com. <laughs>